Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Isn't, isn't, wasn't the sunshine nice this weekend? Oh, man, thank you, Lord, for sunshine. It was so good just to get out in the sun, and we had a fire down by the river and just to sit there. It's so, so nice. All right, we've got a couple more days of it, and then we're back to normal. Rain, okay, but that's okay. It'll taste it. It's all good. Hey, if you got your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to be going there in a few minutes. You can get your, your uh, thumb in that passage of Scripture. Um, I want to talk to you today about the baptism or the filling of the Holy Spirit. We are in a series on the Holy Spirit. We've been learning about the Holy Spirit. We're understanding his role and what he does. Now, before you tune me out, just bear with me for a moment. I, I want us to see that the baptism or the filling of the Holy Spirit is one of the greatest gifts that Jesus has given to his children. I'm telling you, it's one of the greatest gifts that Jesus has given to his children, but it's also one of the greatest gifts that a lot of his children reject, ignore, resist, push back on. And it's rejected for all kinds of reasons. We'll get into it in a moment what it is, but, but people, and we've talked about people don't understand it. People get a little freaked out about Holy Spirit talk, um, you know, people have a wrong view of God, um, you know, people fear this gift, people are comfortable where they're at, that's really where a lot of, I'm just comfortable where I'm at, but they don't want more change, they don't want to change, thank you Jesus, uh, thank you for saving me, I'm okay with that, don't take me any further, I don't need anything else, and this kind of what we do, some people don't have a, a clue what it is, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or still learning about the Holy Spirit, so there's lots of different reasons uh, why people resist and reject the gift or the filling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I want to today is bring some clarity and understanding to this experience that the Holy Spirit longs to give to every Christian who would be open and ask him for it. So let me read a passage of scripture before we go to Ephesians. It's going to be up here. Let me read this to you, um, read with you. It says once, this is in Acts chapter one. Again, we're, the early church is being birthed. This is when we, uh, the Holy Spirit comes on the scene. Uh, we've been talking about this the last few weeks. Once when he was eating with them, this is Jesus, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift uh, he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, at, uh, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, but in a, just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And so they're kind of asking, okay, God, you're about to do something. Jesus, you're about to do something. You're sending someone. Is this the time where you're going to deliver us from Roman occupation? We'll finally have, you know, our land back, our power back, our identity back. And, and, uh, and that's what they think is going to happen. They're still kind of a little confused about what Jesus is talking about. And Jesus replied, you know, that's going to happen. The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they're not free to know. In other words, yeah, that's going to happen one day. One day I'm going to come back. I'm going to set everything right. Don't worry about that. But in the meantime, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So let's begin by looking at three baptisms that God has for every person who chooses to follow Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now, I'm going to walk through these three baptisms to get you some clarity on this. The first baptism, all Christians experience. The second two, um, you may never experience. You only experience them if you choose to respond. So all Christians can experience all three baptisms, but all Christians only for sure experience the first one. Let me explain for a moment. Here's the first one. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ. This is salvation, this is when you come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit pursues you. He convicts you of your sin. He, you have that, that come to Jesus moment, so to speak, in your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, you realize there's a time in your life uh, or a season in your life that you turned yourself over to him. You surrendered yourself. You repented of your sin. You received his forgiveness. God does this work in your life, and the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. You come into the family of God. God adopts you into his family. This is the first baptism that every Christian experiences. And this is the most important experience. And if you don't have the other two that I'm going to talk about in a moment, listen, I'm going to, this, this one is enough in one sense. Like this is, if you have experienced salvation, the Holy Spirit, you know, Jesus um, working in your life, and doing this incredible work that the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. Listen, you are going to heaven. You have, you, your e eternity is secure with Christ. This is good news. This, this, is, this is the most important baptism at all, of all. And, uh, and so this is the first one. The second one is this. So the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ. Then at some point, another believer baptizes us into water. 
This is what we call water baptism. And this is that baptism, and this is a, this is a separation part. So we've got salvation, then we have separation. And this is where we, we come and go, okay, this is, what, this is what Jesus did for me. He saved me. That's what we just talked about. And now, then Jesus comes along and says, you know, once you have received me, I want you to be baptized. I want you to follow my command and be baptized in water. And this symbolizes that you're willing to separate yourself you're willing to go public with your allegiance to Jesus Christ, and you're going to symbolically demonstrate in front of a group of people, whether we do it here, we do it in pools, we do it in lakes, we do it everywhere, but you're going to go, and, and it's symbolically you're going under the water, representing your old life, what you used to be, and you're coming up in the new life, and you're saying to people, this is what Jesus has done in my life. This is what the Holy Spirit's done. He's washed me clean. He's, he's taken me from what I used to be, and he's made me a brand new person. This is what God does, and so, and usually another person, and, and originally it was disciples did this, and then as, as the church grew, you know, people did it, and you see it of our church here, you have maybe a small group leader, or a good friend, or a pastor, or somebody, someone who's been influential in their life um, spiritually, gets a, that joy of baptizing them, and, and, and supporting them as they go public in front of their church community, saying, hey, hold me accountable to my life, live for Jesus. I know I'm not going to be perfect, but I want you to encourage me, come alongside me, and that's what we do. And so it's this public profession that we separate ourselves from the world and we say, I am a child of God and I'm bought by the blood of Jesus. He has saved me and my old life is no longer um, controls me, but it's my new life in Christ. It's a powerful moment. And listen, if you haven't been baptized, our next baptism is April 14th. Sign up for it. Connect with the office. Go online. We'd love to celebrate that day with you. So there's, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ. Another believer baptizes us into water. And this is the third baptism that a Christian can experience. Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. This is the supernatural power, the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Now, for some of you, maybe your blood pressure's rising a little bit because like, of your background. You're like, okay, Sean, don't get all weird on me, okay? Like, this is come. Like, can we, I, I get the salvation thing. I'm even okay with the water baptism stuff. You know, like, I, I mean, that, but let's not get fanatical about this whole Jesus thing, okay? Let's just relax. No, no, listen. God has, through his Holy Spirit, incredible experiences for you. And he wants to give you, and we've talked this, made this series about calling it making room in our lives for the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us. And listen, the reason so many people push back or ignore this experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the filling of the Holy Spirit is because of all the bad press and packaging it has received over the years. And maybe you've seen a, a lousy package, so to speak. Something, see, listen, something good can be packaged badly, and we'll reject it, won't we? It can be something good, but it's packaged badly. The package can, can uh, look or sound confusing, and so what we'll do, even though it's a good thing inside that package, we'll ignore it. I came across a few packaging that maybe to give you an example. How about this one? Like, this is like, this is not a good packaging. You know, they put the handle right in the baby's mouth. But pampers are good, diapers are good. You know, they're a good thing, but you're kind of, whoa, that's crazy. What about this one? This is, a, this is an interesting one. Um, Tastes like grandma, homemade jam, black raspberry. Okay, someone wasn't thinking, I like raspberry jam, that's good, but you know, the packaging is not done uh, very effectively. And then there's one more I came across, this one here, like, um, you know, my dog. <laughs> you know, the right message, lousy packaging, okay? You know, and so um, this is what kind of what happens, right? So, so let me quickly show you how... Uh, the Holy Spirit operates in our lives, how the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens uh, in our lives. You can get rid of the cat picture now. That'd be good. So we don't, we don't, need, we don't need Satan looking over my shoulder, okay? And um, um, so, <laughs> all right, all the cat people, send your emails to dean at mainstreetchurch.ca. Okay, so let me quickly show you how the Holy Spirit operates in our lives, Okay. Let me show you how it operates in our lives, how the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens, and then show you how to live your life continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it starts at salvation. It starts at that first baptism, when, when, we, uh, when, when we were baptized into Christ through salvation, when a person receives Christ, they also, at that moment, when you receive Christ, you also receive the Holy Spirit. And there are three key propositions that are used to describe our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Look in John chapter 14 here. Jesus is teaching again. And he says this. It starts here, by the way. If you want to experience the Holy Spirit in your life, do what Jesus says here in the first part of this verse. If you love me, obey my commandments. If you want to experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life in ways you never thought possible, obey Jesus. 
If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Who's the advocate? The Holy Spirit, who will never leave you. Isn't that good news? Never leave you, always with you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. How many of us need to, we need truth more than ever in this world, don't we? We need to know the truth, and he says he'll lead us into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. So the world's like they're doing their own thing until they are uh, convicted of their sin, until they respond to the ministry and the, and the wooing of the Holy Spirit in their life. They're never going to really know, but the Holy Spirit in his love, he pursues us, and many of us have experienced that. We've responded to that. But listen, he says this, but you, those of us who know Jesus, you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. He lives with you now and later will be in you. And so we see this work of the Holy Spirit. Now note that Jesus said the Holy Spirit was dwelling with or alongside his disciples. The Greek preposition here is this Greek word para, P-A-R-A. And however, later the Holy Spirit would, would be more than with the disciples. The Holy Spirit would be in the disciples, the preposition there in the Greek is en, E-N, or, and, and we know it as in. So later, once Jesus has risen from the dead, he appears to his disciples, and at one point it says that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. John chapter 20, you can read about this. And this is when the disciples went from para, the Holy Spirit with them, to en, the Holy Spirit in them. And, and these two prepositions characterize, listen, your experience and my experience when we come to know Jesus. Prior to our conversion, it was the Holy Spirit who came alongside us, kind of with us, began to convict us, began to lead us, began to show us who he has awakened us spiritually. He was with us and revealed to us Jesus as the one who could take away our sin, who convinced us to accept Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. And once we accepted Jesus as our Savior, the Holy Spirit moved from being with us to being in us. He comes in and resides in our life. We went from para to en. And at this point, the Holy Spirit now is indwelling you. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is indwelling you. He comes and resides in your life and fulfills Jesus' promise that it is better that Jesus leave so that the Holy Spirit can come. This whole principle we've been learning that it's better, um, it's better to have the Holy Spirit in us than Jesus beside us. You know, this principle we've been talking about and Jesus has been teaching us. Now, it's true that at salvation, the Holy Spirit comes and he makes his home in us. He resides in us. But that does not mean we have necessarily been filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, Jesus says, you shall receive power to be my witnesses. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Acts one says. And this is a third Greek preposition. It's this Greek word epi, E-P-I. And um, the Spirit comes upon you, or the Spirit comes over you. So there is a progression of the Holy Spirit's work in our life. He, there's this work that he does. It's this kind of progression as he moves in our life. He begins with us, then he comes in us, and then he is upon us or over us. It's powerful work. And the epi empowers the believer for service, this, this upon us. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and fills us, it's an outflowing of the Spirit's power in our life. It's that supernatural power that we talked about. So let me, let me put it this way, just help you understand it. It's one thing to have the Holy Spirit with you, para, another thing to have the Spirit in you, and, but something even more to have the Holy Spirit upon you. And the Holy Spirit wants to do this in your life. Let me explain it this way. You're wondering what my magic trick here is. Let me... Let me pull this off here. I've got some milk. Now this here, this is you. This is me, okay? And we're just walking along life, and we're experiencing things. The chocolate syrup, this is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay, represents him. And what happens is that you're doing life, and the Holy Spirit begins to work in your life. He's with you. He begins to convict you of your sin, you're doing stuff, man, I shouldn't be doing this, something's starting to happen, and he's starting to awaken you spiritually, maybe people are witnessing to you, you have friends and family who are praying for you, and things are happening in your life, and the Holy Spirit is beginning to, to, 
to call you to your, himself and, and point you towards Jesus and you start having questions and you're coming to church or whatever it may be and all of a sudden you begin to understand that you have a need for a savior. You realize that your sin separates you from God and there's a way, the only way to have relationship with God is to receive the forgiveness and the grace of God through Jesus Christ and so one day uh, either it's a prayer you prayed or it's an, uh, just an, a season of your life where you begin to submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And in that moment, so the Holy Spirit is with you, but when you make that decision, then he is in you. And so the Holy Spirit, he goes in you. He's in you. Yeah, he is filling you up. There it is. There. He is, the Holy Spirit is in you. And so that's awesome. The Holy Spirit's in you. You're a Christian now. You've come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit is indwelling your life. He's in there. He's doing stuff in your life, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. Now, this is where most Christians end up living their life. And it's not bad. You're saved. You're going to go to heaven. God is in you. The Holy Spirit's dwelling in you. He's doing some work in your life. But, but it's kind of where, but, but, but you and I, we don't really see a difference, do we? It's like, okay, but you're saved, and you're doing your thing, and you're, you're living your life, and you're trying to do right stuff, and, and so forth. But, but, you know, you probably maybe still have some things in your life. There's some, there's some sin in your life. Maybe there's some bondages. There's some things that you just can't seem to get over. There's, there's, there's slavery to things, and maybe choices, maybe thought life, maybe actions. Maybe you haven't, you're still doing things that you, you shouldn't be doing. But, you know, you're a Christian, and you kind of feel bad about those things. You know, you're convicted of that stuff, but you just seem can never get over those sinful habits or stuff in your life that, that just seemed to hold you back. And you're thinking, man, okay, I love you, God. I'm thank you that you saved me, but I mean, I wish there was more power in my life. I wish there was more work that would show that you're actually doing a work that's leading me to live in supernatural power. And this is where the epi power, this is what we're talking about, that, 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 that something even more to have the Holy Spirit upon you. Oh, he's in you. But what would it look like for him to have you upon you? And then the Holy Spirit comes upon you in power, and then something happens, doesn't it? Things change, and things look different, and things start to change color. Can you see it from that perspective? I can see it here. But, um, but it is good. It's changing. It's going there to now. We've got like some chocolate milk now, don't we? And, and, um, and what happens now, the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And now I can see that's chocolate milk. I can, something's different. It's not, I mean, something's changed. Something's been added to that. Something looks different. And this is what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Because a lot of Christians, we live our lives, and no one ever knows that we are filled with this supernatural power that the Holy Spirit wants to overflow in your life. So when others see you, they see something different. They actually know that you've been changed by the Holy Spirit. Another way to illustrate this, it'd be maybe a different way to help you understand. It'd be like your furnace at home. You have a furnace at home, and you know, you go down there, and winter comes, and there's a little pilot light in that furnace, right? You can see that little pilot light. It's just a little, little flicker, like a candle. And, uh, and you know what? This is, this is the Holy Spirit in you. You're like that furnace, the Holy Spirit. You come to know Christian. You become a Christian. The Holy Spirit's in you. you got that little pilot light. Poof, there it is. There he is. The Holy Spirit, he's in your life. He saved you. You're saved. You're blocked by the blood of Jesus. You're going to go to heaven. It's a beautiful thing. But then, but then you know what? There's not much impact from that furnace, which is a pilot light. And it's getting cold outside, and your house is getting a little chilly. And so what do you do? You turn up the, fur, the thermostat. And what happens? That little pilot light lights those cylinders, and it, And then what happens? You walk around your house, and you go to those vents, and you can feel the heat. Things start warming up. There's a difference. Now it's impacting. That, that furnace now is having an impact on your entire home. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. He doesn't want just to just kind of, I mean, he's thankful. He, he wants to save you. It's great that you got the Holy Spirit in you, but he wants to fire up his power, his supernatural power in your life so that you can live in such a way that the heat of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit is making a difference in the world that you live and in the life that you're living. This is the beauty of it. So how does that work? How do we experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then live our lives continuing to be filled with his power, to be continue being filled with his presence? Well, Paul's going to give us some instructions. Paul later on now begins to teach on what the Holy Spirit, what Jesus was teaching about the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, he taught about the Holy Spirit. We're coming up to Easter. This is what he chose to make sure they understood and were prepared for, the power of the Holy Spirit as he went to the cross and as he rose from the dead. And then later Paul would pick up the message and the church was birthed and the Holy Spirit would empower them to have an impact 
And this is what Paul says. He's going to give some more teaching on the Holy Spirit. He says, so be careful how you live. Good advice. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. We'll pick this apart in a moment. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Isn't that true? We have people, Dean just talked to we have people in this room who would stand up right now and say, yes, that ruined my life. That ruined my life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in this passage, we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is one of my favorite commands in all of Scripture, by the way. I love this command. Because here's the deal. You know it. By nature, we don't like commands, do we? You don't like commands. I don't like them. No one likes to be told what to do. But this command in Scripture is different. This command is one that I think is, a, is, is, is pretty easy to obey, and we'll see why in a moment. Now, it's probably hard to think about what we just read as a command, because when you think of commands, you probably think of things like the Ten Commandments or a list of rules. When it comes to commands, we tend to think of things we're not supposed to do, right? We, you know, we shouldn't lie or steal or envy or, you know, those kind of things. Co commands are often understood as things we should not be doing. And so Paul comes along and he tells us that we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit and it just feels like something we should do, doesn't it? I don't know about you, be filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't go, ugh. I go, that just sounds good. That just sounds like something that's really going to be good for me. I, now, I know some of you are going, that doesn't sound like that to me, Sean. Because your background and your confusion and your experiences and you, and you, and it just sounds scary and weird maybe to some of you. But can I just ask you, just open up your heart. Because remember, God always gives us good things. He is good and kind. His gifts are beautiful and powerful. He never gives you anything that will hurt you or mess you up. He gives good gifts. And so we have this great gift that we're commanded to be filled with, the Holy Spirit. Yet many people do not live their lives being filled with the Spirit of God. Now, if you're a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to understand, as we've mentioned, the Holy Spirit indwells you. He is inside of you. When you invite Jesus into your life, he takes up residence in you. However, what we need to understand is just because the Holy Spirit is in you does not mean that you are living a life filled with the Holy Spirit. You're not living an empowered life. The scriptures are clear in that there is a distinction between being indwelt by the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. A Spirit-filled person is a person who is leading a life that is led and controlled by the Spirit of God. It is living your life every day, inviting the Holy Spirit to fill you. And why would we need him to fill us? Well, we come back to this. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. See, see we live in a world that a lot of temptation and choices come our way. Things are coming across our path that we're going to, quite frankly, need power to stand up against to stand firm in. How many of us are really careful about how we live, are you? I mean, do you ever think that way? I need to be careful about how I live. I need to be careful of the decisions and choices I make. I need to be careful how we spend my time. Most people do not think this way, do they? The Holy Spirit is the one who helps you be careful in how you live. You need his power for that. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. In the original language of this verse, which is Greek, it conveys the meaning of ransom. It conveys this meaning to redeem something. To take our lives, to take our time and ransom it. To take it back, capture it and use it in a wise way. This is what Paul's telling us to do. This is the picture of the Bible. Uh, this is the picture the Bible gives regarding your time. How much time, does anyone here have more than 24 hours a day? I'm just curious. We all have the same amount of time. We have all the same amount of time. We're on the even playing field. And time in our lives is just spilling out. And, and so Paul says, we need to ransom it. We need to redeem it. Because, listen, time is your enemy. It really is evil unless we ransom it and use it 
properly because you can get into a lot of trouble over time. You can mess up your life over time. Time will do you in. And in order to, to live the kind of life we, that, that redeems the time, that makes a use of every opportunity, we need the filling and the power of the Holy Spirit every day. And then what do you say in verse 17? It says, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. Um, in other words, don't be foolish. Don't be stupid. Don't just live your life. Don't just exist. Don't just let life happen. So Paul's saying, let the Holy Spirit lead you. Let him direct your life. So what does the Lord want you to do? Because what he says, you know, understand what the Lord wants you to do. Well, what does the Lord want me to do? What does the Lord want you to do? Well, look at verse 16. Or at verse 18. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. So there's the will of God right there, first of all. <laughs> Don't be drunk. Don't abuse alcohol. Drunkenness is a sin. It will ruin your life. Folks, it really will. I mean, don't play with, I'm not, I'm not one to get up here and say you can never drink alcohol because the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible just says don't get drunk. That's a sin. It'll mess up your life. But I also know that you need to be very careful in how you, how you spend your time. I mean, I always say, can you, can you stop drinking if you wanted to? Can you stop having that glass of wine? And I would just suggest, if, you, like, if, if, you, if you're more prone to, to defend your right to end the day with a glass of wine every day or whatever, or a beer in your hand, and, and you'll defend that more than to give it up, you got a problem. You're not being led by the Spirit. You're defending something that you just, you know, this isn't, you know. And, 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 and Paul, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. If you need help with that, we got a program here. Monday nights, come check it out. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. That's what God's will. Instead, here's God's will too. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting to see this contrast that Paul uses, isn't it? We get a clear understanding of what the Lord wants us to do. What's his will? To your life and my life. God wants you and I living our lives being filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, you cannot live a victorious Christian life without being filled with the Holy Spirit. Continually, every day. If you keep reading on in chapter 5, you'll read about things like marriage and um, parenting and your workplace, working with that crazy boss or that you know, lousy co-worker who you know, doesn't carry their load. Or, I mean, you have all kinds of situations. And Paul's saying, look, you need the Holy Spirit for your marriage, for your family, for parenting, for working, for all these scenarios of life. You need a filling. You need some special kind of power to live like Jesus wants you to live. Now, what does it look like to live your life filled, baptized, empowered with the Holy Spirit? Well, Paul uses alcohol as a contrast to explain what it means to be filled with the Spirit. It's kind of interesting. I always get, this verse always is interesting to me. Um, now, as I said, many of you have come out of a lifestyle of substance abuse. Some of you are maybe struggling with substance abuse in your life now. And that's, that's your thing you can't seem to get free from. You, you're, it's, it's a bondage in your life. And, you, and maybe you wonder why Paul would use drunkenness as a contrast to explain being filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, the enemy will always try and copy God's ways. He's a counterfeiter. He'll try to get you into things and cause you to believe the lie that it'll get you the same result of what God offers. And it's interesting that alcohol even is referred to as spirits, isn't it? I mean, it's interesting what happens here. The devil will make things look good and then distort it all so you end up getting burned, getting messed up. So Paul takes a negative outcome, even a sinful outcome, drunkenness, to illustrate a positive outcome that he wants you to, he wants to contrast the bad with the good. There's similarities, but look where this gets you and look where this gets you as we're gonna see in a moment. So he uses alcohol and drunkenness to teach us about the filling of the Holy Spirit. Figure that, interesting, isn't it? Now, listen, when you are drunk, the alcohol in you is calling the shots, isn't it? When, you're, when a person is drunk, the alcohol that's in them is calling the shots. No one gets drunk by looking at a bottle, <laughs> or smelling a bottle, that's not how it works. They must consume the bottle, and the more they drink, the more drunk they will get. That's how it works, in case you didn't know. And to be drunk means you have been taken over by a substance, and it's impacting your reflexes, it's impacting your balance, it's impacting your speech. 
It's what it does, right? It impacts your thoughts. Every inch of you is impacted by the alcohol that is in you. This is what happens. Listen, this is the idea of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives, that we are soaked and saturated with him, and he is the one that's in control, that he would impact your speech, that he would impact your actions, that he would impact your thoughts, every part of our lives, that he would make you alive to the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, wouldn't it be interesting if I was up here and I pulled out maybe a six-pack or a bottle of wine, and I said, hey, guys, I'm thirsty. I'm going to keep teaching you, but I'm going to just have a sip. And I just keep sipping and drinking while I'm teaching. <laughs> imagine that. Don't imagine that. Okay, don't. <laughs> but things could get a little crazy, couldn't they? Things could get a little weird. And, uh, and I, I'm just sipping away, and I can only take swigs of this until the whole bottle is empty. Now, people become very different when they're under the influence of alcohol, don't they? I mean, you've seen it. Maybe you've experienced it. A drunk person is not the same person they are when they are sober. They're different. They act differently. They talk differently. I mean, think about it. When a person is drunk, there's an immediate transformation in that person's life. Something changes. Here is what happens. You may know it yourself. Everybody now is suddenly your friend. Hey, buddy. I love you, man. I love, you love everybody. You probably, and you say it to anybody, you'll listen. You never tell any, you barely tell your spouse you love them. You get alcohol in you. I love you, man. Things change. Things change, right? You suddenly become a very bold person. You can do anything. I can, I can jump off that. I can do this. I can do that. All of a sudden, you're doing things you would never think of doing when you're sober. Nothing scares you anymore. You can do anything. You have no problem moving out of your comfort zone and stepping right into the comfort zones of other people, don't you? How you doing, man? Good to see you, Right? I mean, like, you know, you would never do that other way. I mean, like, you'll hug people. You'll, I mean, things change. And here's the clincher. A drunk person cannot hide the fact that they're drunk. <laughs> you know? I mean, you, some people maybe can to a certain degree, but, oh, well, if you're really drunk, you know that person is drunk. There's a lot of similarities to what the Spirit does in your life and what alcohol does, but one for good, one for bad. Why do people drink in the first place? Because they're worried, they're stressed, or whatever it may be. And that's all I drink. When the Spirit fills you, he gives you the peace that passes all understanding. You turn to, Lord, Holy Spirit, I need you to fill me in the midst of my worry and anxiety. And all of a sudden, this peace that has no earthly definition begins to overwhelm your life. The other side, you're just masking it. You're just trying to get rid, trying not to think about it. Some people, some people drink to get courage. That's why they call it liquid courage, right? That's what we do. The book of Acts says that when the Spirit filled the disciples, they had boldness. They could, I mean, they were, they were really to share the hope that was within them, the Christ, their hope. Now some, some drink because they have, they're having problems and alcohol is an escape, right? Having trouble in my life, I just want to forget about it, so I'm going to go drink. Romans 5 says that the Spirit sheds abroad God's love in your hearts and assures you that your children, you're a child of God. It's the, the, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, man, now you've got this assurance in your life. When, you're, when you don't have the Holy Spirit, you turn to alcohol, man, it's just like, you're just trying to mask it. I'm going to try to hide this. Some drink to be able to open up about their feelings and be vulnerable. Oh, man, I better, before I share this, I better have a few drinks so I can share what's on. No, listen, the Spirit gives you the security that comes from knowing you are God's child so that you can let others see your weaknesses and that you're made strong in Christ. And Paul uses this analogy of drunkenness and being filled with the Spirit. See, alcohol and the Spirit both produce some of the same things in you, but they do it in entirely different ways. One for the good, the other for the bad. See, alcohol is a depressant that dulls your senses to reality, makes you less aware of your surroundings. The Holy Spirit, by contrast, acts as a stimulus that makes you more aware of your reality. You understand what's going on? Both alcohol and the Spirit give you a way to cope with the difficulties of life, but entirely different ways. The Holy Spirit gives you a way to cope by opening your eyes to the reality of God, Alcohol gets rid of worry by making you forget. The Spirit of God gets rid of worry by helping you remember who he is and who you are in Christ. Alcohol gives you courage by making you unaware of the dangers around you. The Spirit gives you courage by showing you how much larger God is in your fears and gives you discernment in your life to see what you need to see. Alcohol adds excitement to your life by giving you a cheap thrill. The Spirit adds excitement to your life by reminding you of the overflowing promises of God and his goodness to you and that he has plans and purposes for you. 
that he's called you by name. This is a picture that God is trying to have us understand. God wants us to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that we cannot come face to face with another person without them knowing that God is in you and flowing out of you through his Holy Spirit. We're to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that people should see him in every action that we make. Just like a drunk person, every move they make confirms they're under the influence of alcohol. Okay, that guy's drunk. Now look at them. What an idiot. That's what we begin to think. Look what they're doing. Look what they're saying. I'm embarrassed, whatever it may be. It's different with the Holy Spirit. But we should be able to see in each other, and people should see in you, in every move and action you make, that you are controlled and led by the Spirit of God. And every move we make should confirm that we are under the influence and full of the Holy Spirit as he directs and leads our lives so that we are an example of the very nature and person of Jesus Christ. Now, church, listen, can you imagine if we actually lived like that? If we lived our lives filled with the Holy Spirit, so full of God's Spirit that when people come along your path, they cannot help but be confronted with the fullness of God's Spirit living inside of you and flowing out of you. Now, understand this. The command to let the Holy Spirit fill and controls you, control you begins begins by you inviting the Holy Spirit to baptize you and fill you with his power and presence. And then that you would do that every day. Because this filling that Ephesians 5 talks about is not a one-time filling. It's over and over and over. We need to continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a continual response to him. It's something you must keep asking for and doing. Just like getting drunk, in one sense, If I were to choose to get drunk and stay drunk, what would I have to do? Keep drinking. That's how it works. That is the same idea as being full of the Holy Spirit. I have to continue to ask him to fill me. It's a continual action. You initially get filled up, and then you keep getting filled up by the power of the Holy Spirit. And why do I need to keep filling, getting filled up by the Holy Spirit? Well, here's the deal. You leak. (laughs) We leak. And we work, and we move, and we live our lives empowered by the Spirit, and we are a witness, and we're living and being led by his truth and his power. But, oh, but you know, that can be overwhelming. It can be, you know, we kind of like, oh, God, I need more strength. I'm tired. I'm feeling weak. Holy Spirit, fill me again. And every day we get up and say, Holy Spirit, fill me with your power. And the Holy Spirit knows you need him to live the life he has called you to. So we are to continually be filled with the Spirit. So as the team come, let me just close with this. How can I live my life being filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, it starts with Jesus. You love me, you obey my command. So you obey the Scripture's command to be filled. But recognize that it's an interesting command. So do not lie. Okay, I'll obey that, I won't lie. You know, do not steal. Okay, I'll obey that, I do not steal. This is an interesting command. You can't fill yourself. The command is be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, I want to obey that. How? How do I obey that? How? I can't fill myself. You that you are commanded to be filled. Be filled with the Spirit. I don't know how to do that by myself because I can't fill myself with the Holy Spirit. God does the filling. He's the one that fills me with his Spirit. We are called to partner. There's something we have to do. We must thirst after God, have a, have a hunger for him. We must desire to be filled. We must desperately want to be filled. And I pray that's your heart, church, that you have a desperation in your life to want everything the Holy Spirit has for you. It's about relationship and digging into his words and saying, God, give me all that you have. And so the question this morning, I'd ask you, do you want to be filled? Do you want everything the Holy Spirit has for you? If so, then here's what you do. Ask him. Ask him. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. See, it's all about how serious you are about responding to this truth in Scripture. It's all about... It's all about how badly you really want what God has to offer you. How badly do you want to be that person who cannot hide God in your life? Because that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. To have those moments where you can just boldly proclaim His truth and people see it. I was walking around yesterday at a trade show and I was uh, wearing my Project 315 shirt. If you've seen our, our apologetics conference, all it says is 315 on it. I'm, I'm looking, so I'm finding one guy, okay, I'll bite. Some guy says, okay, I'll bite. This lady says, I'll bite. I don't, I don't know what she's talking What do you mean? Well, I'll bite. What does 315 mean? Oh, well, here's my chance. I, I tell people, wear the shirt, because people ask you, what does that mean? 
I said, oh, you know what? Um, it's actually a scripture verse that describes what God's done in my life. And it says, you know, that um, speaks of this hope that I have in Christ. To always be ready to give an answer for this hope that I have. And, 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 I, and it just declares that, you know, I just started sharing that, you know, God's changed my life and I'm a Christian and Jesus has met me and he's touched me and he's changing me and he's helped me become the kind of person I want to be. So I just, I just used this little 315 and, and, and the power of the Holy Spirit began just to share my faith. And I actually had that trade show, I did like with three, three different people asked because all these little booths, right? And so you come along and they, what's the, one guy says, shouldn't it be 316? Well, that's a good one too. We can talk about that. It's just little things like that, folks. We just have that empowerment of the Holy Spirit to be bold and to live a life that, that displays his truth in you. So if you want to be filled, let's ask him to fill us afresh today. Could you stand with me for a moment? As the band's going to sing a song in a moment, I, I want to invite those of you who wish to be filled with the Holy Spirit to respond this morning. Now you may think, well, I'm already, I've been, I've been, bad. I've, I know what you're talking about, Sean. I, I know you do, but you know what? Sometimes there's two, there's two responses here today. Those who maybe have never really taken the time to respond to the Holy Spirit. And that you would say, okay, Holy Spirit, I want everything you have for me. I've never even asked you to fill me. But today I want you to be able to have that response. And for those of you who have experienced a filling, that you just say, God, I want more of you. I want more of you. I want more filling in my life. And here's what we're going to do this morning in the next just closing moments. The band's going to lead us in a song. There's going to be people, our prayer teams are going to be off to the sides. They're going to be way off on the sides here. So if you want specific prayer from someone or to pray, you can walk over to them. But here's what I just want those of you who are ready and willing and willing to take that. I know it's a scary thing to do and these are kind of like, but I just gonna, we're going to open up this altar, open up this front. And we're just gonna have, if you just want to come and spend a few moments here and you just ask the Holy Spirit to feel, well, I don't know how to do that, Sean. Well, let me, I, I put a little slide up here. You can just follow this. There's a few things. Remove all barriers. That you'd make room for the Holy Spirit by repenting of any sin like doubt or fear in your life. Confusion, resistance. God, I'm just so sorry. I, forgive me for not trusting. Forgive me for believing lies. Forgive me for me letting my tradition get in the way or whatever it may be. And you just request the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just tell Jesus that you want all that he has for you. And you just take a moment before and say, Lord Jesus, I want the filling of your spirit in my life. I want to experience everything you have for me. Then receive him by faith. You know, it's not like, oh, what happens? No, you just, re- just like when you accepted Jesus, you were confident he came into your life. It's the same with this. Lord, fill me. You don't have to, you know, God does move through our emotions and he might minister to you in different ways, but, the, but you can walk away assured that he will answer that prayer and you'll begin to see the outflow of it in your life as you begin to live in the sensitivity of the leading of the Spirit. And then relate to him daily. You get up tomorrow morning, God, fill me again today. Fill me again today. But maybe right now we could just take a few moments before we dismiss and say, sing a song. Why don't you just fill these altars for a few moments? Because there's something about stepping out of your comfort zone that God meets us in those places. And I know maybe you can't everyone get up here. Maybe you want to just you know, sit at your seat or, or you can move around, wherever, find a spot. And as they lead us in this song, that's all I'm going to say, and I'll come back and close us in prayer. But let's just take a moment and say, Holy Spirit, I want to be filled and experience all that you have. As they sing, why don't you come?
church with supernatural power, that we can walk in victory, that we can be witnesses like you promised, that we shall receive power to be witnesses in this world. And I pray, Lord, for those this morning who have just said, God, I want more of you. I want everything you have. Holy Spirit, would you just meet us, those who are up front, maybe some who are still in their seats, and say, Holy Spirit, fill me afresh today. As we walk out of this place, God, I know the enemy is going to come. He's going to try to lie to us, try to get us offline with you. But Lord, would your people stand firm in the fullness of your spirit? And God, that you would make them light shows of your love and grace. God, I pray as you fill people today, Lord Jesus, that you'll break bondages and addictions in their lives. You'll break lies that they've been believing. You'll set people from slave, things they're enslaved to today. Because God, that's what you do. And so Lord, we just rejoice in this wonderful gift of your Holy Spirit who longs to lead us and help us and, and direct us and lead us into all truth. Lord, that we can live lives with wisdom and not be, uh, not be wasting our time, but using it for your glory. Holy Spirit, fill your people afresh today. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you're doing here in this church, in our hearts and our lives, and we submit to you fully. This is your church, Jesus. We say, have your way. Your ways are better than ours. And Lord, we want to be in step with all that you're doing. Lord, would you bless your people today? Would you encourage them? Fill them afresh, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Folks, don't rush off. Take a moment. Just spend some moments. But if you need to go, you are dismissed. God bless you, church. But let's just sing this one more time but as, as you go. But don't, don't rush off. If you want specific prayer, we have people on the sides who are willing to pray for you. Just walk on over to them and they'll pray a special filling over your life. Come.